We're live. We're live now. We're live now. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to Space Club XV, Extended Voyage. Um, just to give you all a rundown on why it's called that, we did this, as I've mentioned a few times on Twitter, maybe in other episodes. We used to do this every Thursday in the grad club at Western University. We'd sit around the table. Uh, Phil would order us some nachos very graciously. Uh, grad students would eat them and listen to a rundown of last week in space exploration. Um, they were there to listen and not just for the nachos. Yeah. <laughs> Tanya, I don't remember. Did you ever actually come to one of our meetings? Oh. I was when I was in grad school, I didn't get to come to anything. <laughs> oh, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we've all moved on now. Uh, thankfully, there's life after grad school. Um, and in Phil's case, there's life after work, and he's enjoying right. retirement. Tanya, I'm still doing just as much work, but I'm not being paid for it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're still appreciated the same, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, me and Tanya have moved on. Uh, I work at the Canadian Space Agency now. She works at uh, Planet. And uh, but we wanted to to get the space club back together, um, you know, in our day to day lives and not being in grad school. We don't get to see all the updates as much as we'd like to. When you're in grad school, you're pretty much immersed in the space world. Um, but even though we all work in it, we still miss news here and there and we miss getting the news every week. Um, we don't think right now as professionals, we have time to do this every week, but we figured every month we'd get together. Uh, hopefully with some of our old friends joining in the chat live or just catching it later on YouTube that we can just bring back Space Club. The reason I put the XV at the end is because I look at this as the extended voyage. Uh, we, in, in space exploration and planetary science, when your primary mission is done, but you still have enough electricity, power, whatever it may be to continue doing things, it's often called an extended mission or in 1950s sci-fi language, extended voyage. Um, so we kind of see this as an extended version of the old, uh, well, Space Club slash Planet Club, which was my attempted coup to rename it. But um, R Robbie's here. Hey, Robbie. Hello, Robbie. Hi, Robbie and Phil. One, two of the regulars uh, from Space Club at Western. So great to see people joining. And that's just a quick rundown of, of the name. And thankfully, I won't have to do that every time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we figured, so, oh, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. So today we're, we're gonna go over a bit of the late breaking news in the planetary world. And then also, <laughs> sorry, I can see the comments popping up on the side. Um, and then also a little bit of a retrospective on the Cassini mission since it is, uh, October was the launch anniversary of the Cassini mission. So um, take a look at those those things. Yeah, and I mean, we kind of got <laughs> sidetracked. I showed the poster to someone who works at NASA, and I was like, oh, yeah, like, I hope you watch. And he's like, you're doing a Cassini thing after we discovered water on the moon? And I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, fair point. Like, we probably should think about current events when we're planning these. But it, um, I mean, other than hearing the rumors when you're in the space community, you don't always know what's going to get announced. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought we would open today with uh, the breaking news of the month, certainly. Um, water on the spoon. Um, we've had a time to take a look at the paper, and I'm sure a lot of people watching have as well. The big deal here is frozen water trapped deep inside, possibly some glass or sand or regolith, um, in the sunlit areas of the moon, which is not where we would expect H2O or HO to survive. And just to talk about <laughs> what H2O or HO is, maybe Tanya as a geologist, where you guys call everything water, you can explain um, what exactly was found or, or more so what was found and why it's important. Sure. So we hear about this usually in terms of Mars. We, we constantly discover water on Mars. And in geology, we talk about water in terms of H2O, like what you're used to hearing about um, here on Earth, the kind of stuff that comes out of your tap or out of your freezer. But we also consider hydroxyl, which is OH, to be water in the context of geology a lot of the time. And on the moon, 
we knew that there was probably hydroxyl and maybe some H2O locked in the permanently shadowed regions of the South Pole, which kind of makes sense because those areas are extremely cold. They are never exposed to direct sunlight. And the idea is that maybe you were getting some water implanted in these areas coming down from space. But finding water in the form of H2O in a sunlit part of the moon was completely unexpected because we don't have a good idea of how you would be able to sustain it there. Um, and maybe Phil can explain some of the significance of this discovery and maybe more of the details from the paper itself. Yeah, just before I let Phil talk, who everyone is here to actually see talk. Um, the, the other really cool thing about this, which I kind of surprised me when I started reading more than just headlines, was it was discovered by Sophia, which is a, it's not a space satellite, it's not a ground uh, telescope, it's a high altitude flight, um, or, or it, it's a telescope on board a mocked up or adjusted commercial airliner, uh, which peers out towards the solar system. Um, so Sophia is not, you know, it doesn't get all the credit uh, it sometimes deserves, but this is cool to see like a very big discovery um, coming out of Sophia. So yeah, Tanya, like you said, um, maybe Phil can talk about uh, the importance of this and a few clues uh, here also for what we can talk about. Right, well, um, I, I think uh, it, it's certainly significant. Uh, here we are uh, looking at the uh, moon. That gets pretty hot. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden we find that there's a, there's a bit of water on the surface. Um, now, uh, we've been getting used to the idea over the last uh, decade or two that there's going to be water on the moon uh, in permanent shadows at, at the lunar poles. Uh, and I guess people hadn't really expected that there would be all that much elsewhere. And yet we did have several observations uh, going back nearly, well, about 20 years, uh, from different spacecraft, Cassini being one of them, when Cassini did uh, an Earth flyby on its way to... Uh, to oh, how'd that get there? What's that, what's that doing there? Because uh, <laughs> you uh, never promote yourself. I mean, I don't know if people are... I mean, the, the diehards will pay for this, but sorry, go on. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so Cassini... Um, uh, Cassini looked at the moon as it was flying past Earth, and it did detect a little bit of uh, uh, of, of water, apparently, uh, on the surface, and so did the Deep Impact spacecraft, uh, and uh, so did India's Chandrayaan-1. And uh, I, at the time, individually, I think people looked at that and they thought, there's something wrong with these observations because there shouldn't be any water. Uh, yeah. But when they discovered that everybody else was seeing it too, they realized there was something there. So that uh, and that was announced, uh, you know, at the time, quite a long time ago. But um, it, it wasn't really clear whether it was molecular water or whether it might be hydroxyl ions uh, that are sort of uh, attached to, uh, absorbed onto the surface of uh, other uh, uh, other materials like uh, like impact glass and so on. Uh, the exact state of that wasn't really quite obvious. Hmm. Uh, and now, uh, apparently, we do have a, a very clear determination that there is a lot of actual molecular water. Uh, now, I kind of think that the uh, amounts might have been exaggerated in the in the media. I, uh, I think uh, that, that, that there wouldn't be a vast amount, that, that it wouldn't actually be at all practical to try to uh, extract that water and, and make rocket fuel or drinking water uh, from that, because it's still going to be small amounts spread out across the uh, the surface but uh, but still uh, it, it's there and i think my my feeling is the most significant thing about it is that if it is there then every now and then one of those molecules is going to get detached from the surface and it'll hop around a bit some of that will escape from the moon but some of it may hop into a permanent shadow area and that and this might be a mechanism that gradually builds up the ice at the poles uh, you know it's sort of uh, it, it, it forms everywhere, it hops around a bit, uh, and some of it gets trapped in those polar shadows. Uh, so that might be, and then, you know, over the course of a billion years or so, that builds up to a reasonable amount in the polar shadows. I think that might be the most significant thing about it, ultimately, that it, it provides a potential source for some of the polar uh, ice. So when are you going to publish your nature paper on this uh, 
this proposed model because this is pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, I'll, uh, I'm not going to publish anything on it because I don't really know anything. About it. So uh, I'm just uh, offering that as a possibility. Maybe somebody else can take it up. But um, I, you don't I, sound I, like an academic, Phil. You're supposed to know everything about whatever you want, and then you just just well, publish. It. I, I always tell people I know everything, but sometimes I have to admit <laughs> privately that it's not quite true. Um, yeah, like one of the estimates I saw was like 12 ounces per cubic meter of of regolith which even if that were true that's an incredible amount of energy to get a glass of water from a cubic meter and then yeah anything if there's really no practical uh, application to that much energy going into getting you a glass of water um but yeah for me the interesting question is like how did it get there um is it a remnant of formation and have, what is its like isotopic relationship to earth water um how much is there obviously so um the only other thing i put on this slide was also this this book if anyone wants to help us out i, don't, I think tanya actually slipped that in i didn't put that in but we can move on to the real presentation um, oh sorry no honorable mention i don't typically do human spaceflight stuff except for the book but um, <laughs> today 20 years ago ISS Expedition 1 launched, and uh, yeah, since then, it's been 20 years straight that there's been humans in orbit, um, 20 years today. So that's pretty cool, I guess. Most of, well, the vast majority of the 21st century, we've had humans orbiting in space. Um, Tanya, do you have a favorite ISS fact? Oh, uh, yes. My Favorite ISS fact is that the first CubeSats that were deployed from the space station were literally thrown away from the space station by a cosmonaut oh. before they had deployers from nanoracks. Speaking of cosmonaut, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of cosmonauts, oh. I'd also like to point out that um, uh, these uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia had a space station before ISS. Uh, it was called Mir, uh, and it was continuously inhabited for, I think, at least 10 years, uh, with only um, a relatively short gap of uh, two or three years before ISS came on stream. Uh, so, uh, actually, it's uh, 20 years of continuous occupation of ISS, but I, I would say that uh, over the last 35 years or so, most of the time there have been people in space, too, if we include uh, Mir before that, and then just a little gap bet between Mir and ISS. What yeah, year was cool. the first crew on Mir, do you remember? I don't 86. know. 86? It was around about that time, yeah. But I Yeah, know. 86 was the first shuttle docking, so it actually would have been earlier than that. Um, and Mir was deorbited in 98, um, which, yeah, I think it was March 98. I don't know, I just remember that from my... Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so these gentlemen, Sergei Kirkilov, Yuri P. Gidzenko, and Will Shepard, uh, were the first three to, um, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I was looking to get some CubeSats tossed out of the ISS. Um, one of my favorite things about the ISS is it is one of the many objects in every space documentary that has a ridiculous size analogy that some nerd will be like, football field. Or like every, it's like if 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 the solar system were a grain of sand and the, the galaxy were a beach, the beach would go from LA to New York. It's like what? Just use units. It's annoying, but I came up with my own ISS size indicators. So it's 357 feet long, but if you need something more relatable to imagine, it's 118 yard sticks long. It's a uh, 32 yards short of a Canadian football field. It's 2.5 Hindenburgs. The Zeppelin that blew up. It's 567 um, for all humankinds. If you uh, you want to buy that thing and make a scale model of the ISS. Of 570 of these? Yeah. I wish we could sell 507. <laughs> Um, it's 71 Australian pop singer sensation Kylie Minogue's. 
72 Ikea calyxes or 133 Ikea mounds, if I have both. It's 2.5 times the height of a thousand Triscuits. It's mm. 740 meters shorter than Mount Everest. So that should help you picture it. It's <laughs> 96 fathoms, 75 horseshoe pitches. So this is how you spend your time, is it, Danny? <laughs> <laughs> I was really curious how long Phil would allow this to go on. Hold on, Phil. Yeah. Did anything else happen in the solar system this week? What? <laughs> <laughs> the standard distance between a dart professional and the board, it's 45 of those. So okay. that's not you're... very far. Of all the things you listed, that one makes it sound the smallest in my brain for some reason. Yeah. But I mean, I guess if it's only 108 meters, they stand more than a meter. So yeah. I actually can't remember how, how far they stand from the dart board. Phil, you interrupted 143 Crokino boards, which is a- Yes, and I interrupted for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's like, we're leaving now. <laughs> we can get you lost real- lost five viewers in the span of your description of the space station, which makes me more sad about the viewers. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I've succeeded in making him stop, eh, Robbie. Okay, so let's all just right, have a right. quick look at what's been happening recently. Uh, so uh, just uh, uh, a little while ago, a few days ago, we had uh, the Bepi Colombo spacecraft, which is uh, on its way to Mercury, but making a flyby of Venus along the way. Uh, and uh, um, it certainly would have used its instruments uh, at least for calibration if not for anything particularly scientific but because we'd had uh, some uh, uh, suggestion of the discovery of phosphine uh, a phosphorus compound in the atmosphere of venus uh, with quite a lot of publicity before uh, it's possible that we have a chance to um, uh, uh, to observe that atmosphere and see if it's possible to find uh, any evidence for that. Now, this isn't really the greatest flyby though. There'll be another one next year, uh, which will be closer and will give better results. Uh, but still, I expect people will look at the data from this MERTIS instrument uh, uh, and see if they can see any evidence of phosphine in the atmosphere. Uh, yeah, there's, I saw on Twitter, there's already a paper in challenging the phosphine discovery, but the phosphine yeah. was three separate orbital telescopes, right? Um, I thought they were ground-based, but I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, you're probably right. Okay, so now uh, let's move on to uh, uh, the Chinese rover Chang'e 4, uh, well, Chang'e 4, the lander, and U-2-2, the little rover, which has been driving around on the far side of the moon. Uh, it uh, it works for two days while the uh, two... Uh, two, uh, sorry, it works for two weeks, uh, two Earth weeks, uh, while the sun is up, and then it... Uh, uh, sleeps for two weeks while the sun is down at its landing site. Right now it's the middle of the night uh, for for this uh, rover. Um, but um, this picture was taken uh, in the previous lunar day. And when it started up for the last lunar day, it drove towards that big lump of rock that we can just see on the far side of that little crater. That crater is about 10 meters across. Uh, and it was about 20 meters from where the rover was sitting at that point. So the rover drove up to the edge of that crater around the left side until it could get uh, up close to that big rock on the on the other side there um, and analyze that um, so uh, it's busy every day it's uh, it's working uh, every day doing things uh, and I I would like to do a, a, a one of our, our sessions uh, soon uh, looking at this mission and what it's been doing over the last couple of years We're nearly two years into this mission now uh, yeah okay, absolutely that sounds yeah yeah, let's move on. Uh, so that yeah, this was a, a panorama taken from the uh, end of the, the previous day, uh, with that same crater uh, appearing above the the center of the panorama where the rover was sitting. Uh, so it's just an attempt to reproject the panorama, so you can actually see the uh, the pattern of features around it. Uh, Why everything's kind of on the the left side versus the right side. Is that an actual? the surface actually looks oh natural. no no it's, uh, it's not it's because um uh, on the right hand side uh you're looking down sun the sun's shining uh, you know shining from the left to the the right and a little bit angled um so uh, uh when you look at the the right hand side of that image you're 
looking in the same direction that the sun is going. Oh no, the lunar aliens are trying to keep oh. Phil from drinking. <laughs> you frozen there, Phil? Oh. Uh. <laughs> it's all on you, Danny. How much do you know yeah, about let's the see what he's got next? I, I got it. <laughs> this is the moon. Uh, this is obviously a traverse map. So, for any non initiated, these are what Phil works on quite a bit. So, he's making fun of me finding ISS facts. But, um, he spends his days tracking down rovers on other planets, which I suppose is slightly cooler. Um, Let me see if I take him off the stream and then put him back yeah. if it's anything. He'll jump in. Probably. Ian's not a fan. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. I actually don't keep track much of anything that's going on with the Chang'e missions. It's it's so hard to get any information other than um, the Planetary Society tends to put out some really good blog articles about the things that uh, the Chinese rovers have been up to. Oh, looks like there we got we go. Phil back. Okay, not quite sure what happened there. Don't um, worry, we yeah, can nail so it. We brought Chang'e, so we couldn't uh, fill in for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so this is just part of uh, the map. Uh, that uh, shows where that rover is. So the uh, the crater that uh, they were just looking at is that one right at the top uh, there. Uh, I try to keep this map up to date every month as uh, as we learn what happened during the previous month. All right, and then of course there's good old Curiosity working away on Mars. Uh, it's um, sitting beside that bright rock, this sort of uh, light toned rock that you can see just to the left of the uh, of this rover selfie there. Uh, and it had drilled three separate drill holes into that rock uh, and uh, analyzed them. It's looking at rock with lots of clay in it, which was probably deposited in lakes or some other kind of water-rich environment. And every time it drills, uh, it takes a selfie like this uh, with a camera that is mounted on the end of its robotic arm. So uh, we get that view. And you can't see the arm because they edit it out by taking pictures with the arm in different positions. Yeah, so uh, it's busy, and that's the hole that they just drilled uh, at a place called Grocken, um, which is, Grocken is a place in the Shetland Islands, and all of the place names from around here come from Scotland. Uh, and it drilled that hole, and in the process managed to break the rock, but it's still got uh, uh, enough of a sample that they could analyze it. Uh, so hopefully we've got good results from that. Uh, and now they've moved on. They're a few days uh, away from there now, and they've, uh, they've been driving on towards their next target. And then we have another spacecraft called Insight, uh, which is uh, uh, it, which uh, has deployed a seismometer on the surface, and we're collecting you know, good seismic data all the time. But it's supposed to have a heat probe as well, and they've had a lot of trouble getting the heat probe into the surface. The sequence just shows uh, what they've been doing over the last little while. Uh, at the top left, you can see the heat probe sticking out of the ground, and that should be buried, and not just buried a little bit. It should really be a, a couple of meters down. Uh, in, in the surface material. Um, so it's just kind of uh, sitting there uh, and they had to actually push it down. So on the top right, they've put this scoop on the arm right on top of the mole and they push down with it and it it uh, it does its little hammering thing that tries to push it down into the ground, but with the scoop pressing it so it can't bounce back. Um, oh, uh, that white stuff in the crack in the previous image um, was uh, probably, um, uh, a uh, um, something like magnesium sulfate. Uh, uh, there are uh, sulfates uh, that calcium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, stuff like that, which get uh, precipitated out of solution and deposited in cracks in the rocks. And that's probably uh, one of those things. Yeah. So going back to that, uh, the next slide with insight, they push down on the probe. Uh, lower left, you can see that it's been pushed down most of the way, and now they're piling soil on top of it. So lower right, you can see they've scraped soil up, put it on top, and uh, just recently they pushed down again on that soil to compact it. And I think they'll probably do that a few more times and build up the soil above it, and then press down and then hammer them all again to try to get it down further and further. Uh, but it's been a much more difficult process than they anticipated. Are they able to get any measurements out of it? 
Um, they are, but it's not very meaningful at this stage um, because it's still within the uh, the part of the the um, uh, the surface that that would be sort of warmed every day and cooled every night. So you're getting lots of thermal changes uh, daily, and also because of weather and things like that. You know, weather changes uh, like dust will cool the surface, for instance. So if the atmosphere gets dusty, it's cooler. So they're, they're still bothered by all those things happening. They really need to get down below that before they can get uh, useful data. All righty. And then, of course, there's this uh, rather cute little asteroid, Bennu, uh, which has just had a sample collected from it. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at the next slide. And uh, we see this is a, a very interesting asteroid. It's, um, it's not, not just a kind of static pile of rock. Every now and then, uh, a little spray of debris comes off the surface. Uh, and here we see uh, that happening on one occasion, but it's happened quite a lot of times. Just a little spray of stuff, little, these little particles are just a few centimeters across maximum, and it would be smaller, um, and uh, probably made we think as uh, the surface heats up in the sun and a rock will crack a bit and some little pieces will fly off. Uh, it's not a very energetic thing. It's not like they fly off at high speed and might smash into the spacecraft. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's a fairly low energy thing, but uh, this, the object is so small, only 500 meters across, that its gravity is extremely weak. Uh, and uh, if you just push a little fragment on the surface just a tiny bit, it'll float away. Uh, and some of it will come back to the surface, and some might not. Okay, yeah, we decided yeah. to reenact this scene when the news about the sprays from Bennu came out by taking a little cone and filling it with pop rocks and then putting in water so that they would explode all over the living room, which uh -huh. was followed up with a text saying, we need more pop rocks. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Great. The, uh, the, the material jumping off is actually super serendipitous because the team that wanted to model the gravity of it was unsure exactly how they would do that necessarily when they got there or they were unsure they'd be able mm -hmm. to do it. Um, but these little things are like little mini gravity probes every time they jump off. So they're just modeling how they jump off and adding that uh, to the observations at the object to build an even better gravity model, which I thought was super cool. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, that's interesting. So it's it's quite an active asteroid. And let's look at the next picture. Uh, and it's, uh, there, there's a rock that's probably been cracked by heat, although occasionally small impacts would crack rocks as well. But uh, they think that thermal uh, cycling, hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold, uh, uh, every time the asteroid rotates, uh, might be cracking some of these rocks. Uh, and let's move on. Uh, I, I know these cracks. Yes. <laughs> there is a special issue that came out earlier in October that had six papers on Bennu, and I read all six abstracts. But <laughs> so they think uh, that the parent body would have been would have had potentially significant hydrothermal activity, which is why some of these larger rocks on Bennu may still have remnants of these veins from hydrothermal activity. Um, yeah, that's right. Calcium yeah. carbon. Yeah. 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 Yeah, who's the space professor? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've restored my faith in you, Danny. Uh, and here, uh, this was another thing that came out recently. Some of these little uh, bright uh, rocks, uh, sort of very light-toned rocks, high albedo rocks on the surface. Uh, most of the surface is very dark, but some of these are uh, quite bright. Uh, and by uh, getting spectra from them, they've uh, determined that they seem to be uh, similar in composition to another asteroid called Vesta. Uh, and we know that there are other asteroids that have, small asteroids that have a composition like Vesta, and are thought to have been knocked off of Vesta by big impacts. Uh, and uh, so one of those little Vestoids, as they're called, might have uh, been involved somehow in the Bennu story. Maybe little chips knocked off one of those smaller asteroids uh, that have fallen onto Bennu. Uh, or maybe uh, a larger object collided with Bennu, and what we see now is is sort of mostly Bennu fragments, but also some fragments from the thing that hit it and that kind of thing. We don't necessarily know the exact story there, uh, but some of these bits might be from Bennu. And so it's conceivable that there'll be tiny little chips from 
uh, from Vesta uh, in the sample that's been collected. Yeah, so that's cool. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Also in the special issue, <laughs> all my knowledge of venue comes from reading six abstracts. But um, so one of the, the super beneficial things uh, about these samples most likely is what they're finding with both the, the bright rocks, which are a bit stronger and the dark rocks, is they're the kind of material that wouldn't survive entry onto Earth. So we sh shouldn't have meteorites of this kind of material. So the Osiris-Rex samples will actually be relatively novel to people in the meteoritics world. Yeah, um, right. For example, uh, Phil McCausland, who's watching right now. Uh, the other thing, I had one more thing. Um, Ew. <laughs> <laughs> How do you put that up, but not the one that says Danny you Rock? Put I would I request. sorry. sorry. I ate while Phil was talking, and there's no way for me to move where the banner shows up, and that kind of sucks because it blocks Phil's head. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, any, that's nice. Any, okay, any compliments? I'm, I'm up here. Yeah. <laughs> any Danny related compliments need to go up. <laughs> it's possibly permanently pinned across the top. Um, <laughs> the other thing okay. that just that the material is more pristine than they expected. So what they're seeing on the surface hasn't experienced the amount of weathering as thought most asteroid surface material would. Um, right. But, yeah. Yeah, a, lot of a lot of asteroids, I'm sorry, a lot of meteorites that make it to the surface of the Earth are very hard, very, very consolidated things, iron meteorites and, and uh, silicate meteorites different kinds of things like that. But a few of them are uh, very friable or sort of easily broken up, uh, including things like Tagish Lake, the famous uh, example. Um, uh, and uh, so these might be even more friable, even more easily uh, broken up, but they might uh, have some similarity to uh, samples that are well known by Phil McCausland and, and other meteorite researchers there. It'd be very interesting to see. Okay. So do you think the surface doesn't appear extremely weathered because it's constantly sputtering this stuff off into space? So you're like exposing a fresh surface every once in a while in geologic timescales? Well, maybe. Danny, you read the abstracts. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, so I didn't see any like proposed mechanism for exactly why, okay. but more just to, yeah, like a kind of just a revelation that they there was fresher material than they expected. I mean, I'm more excited to get this sample back than I thought I would be. Like, I don't, I honestly don't pay that much attention to asteroids. Uh, but as soon as I saw Benio, I was like, whoa, this is actually really cool. So I'm really excited to see what we learn about this. Yeah, and let's not forget that in only a few weeks, uh, we will have samples from another asteroid from a Japanese spacecraft, Hayabusa 2, uh, which will be parachuting down into the Australian desert in just a few weeks. And I know that the, the pickup crew, the, the Japanese who will go and, uh, and, and pick that up, have already entered their COVID quarantine to be ready for it. So we're, we're getting quite close to the uh, recovery of uh, samples from another asteroid. Uh, we won't have these Bennu samples for a couple of years. Hmm. Okay, yeah, let's move to the next. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Robbie. Great. Yeah, so this is the actual sampling uh, moment here with the uh, uh, the uh, sampler, uh, tag sampler, t touch and go sampler there. Uh, it touches down, uh, puffs up uh, out a bit of gas that is supposed to blow small fragments into the collector, uh, and then it backs off again very quickly. Uh, and if we go to the next picture, we see a lovely color photo from a monitoring camera on the spacecraft showing that sample head being placed inside the sample return container. Um, we now know that it's safely stowed. They've closed the lid. Uh, everything is uh, is ready to go. Uh, so now we just have to wait for the, uh, the asteroid and, and the spacecraft to actually get back uh, into the right place to return to Earth. But that won't happen for a couple of years now. Okay. All right. So now I guess we'll move on and look at uh, Cassini. So um, I, I remember once in a, in a planet club or space club at, uh, at Western that we were talking about favorite missions. And I think several people said that Cassini was their favorite mission. Uh, and I, I said, ah, well, for me, it was Voyager. But 
that shows how old I am because uh, you had to be there, right? So Voy for me, Voyager was fantastic because it was the first time that we really got to uh, understand what the outer solar system was like. But when we look at the Voyager images now compared with what we had from Galileo and then from Cassini, uh, it's really incredible how, uh, uh, how much better things are from these newer missions. Um, uh, so Cassini was fantastic just because there are so many targets. Uh, like I see here, the planet has it all. You've got the planet itself with its atmosphere and also lots of things around the planet itself, its magnetic field and so on. Uh, you've got a, a giant ring system, lots of moons, and the moons are incredibly varied. We'll see some pictures of them. Uh, and a couple that are really amazing, Titan and Enceladus there, which we'll, uh, we'll look at. Hey, Titan number one. Hello, Ian. There you go. Yeah, all right. Oh, so, yeah. there we go. <laughs> all right, there's the spacecraft, and uh, just a quick timeline. I'm not going to read through the whole thing there, but you can see that uh, it was actually uh, launched in 1997, and the mission ended in 2017. So that's 20 years of solid exploration that they were doing there. Uh, they flew past Jupiter um, uh, for a gravity assist. They got to Saturn in 2004, and so they spent 13 years, which is about half of a Saturn year. Uh, orbiting Saturn and studying it. Uh, and there's that uh, uh, amazing spacecraft that did all that stuff. Okay, let's uh, move on there. And uh, it wasn't just the Cassini spacecraft, it carried a passenger, the Huygens probe, which was from the European Space Agency, uh, and it landed on Titan. It parachuted down through the thick atmosphere of Titan, Titan being the only moon in the solar system that has a thick atmosphere. And this probe parachuted down, taking pictures on the way down. And this, there's a few of them. And when I first saw that picture, um, uh, it was during a, a, a kind of webcast of, a, of a, a landing event at the European Space Agency. And it just appeared up on a monitor on the wall while somebody was talking. Uh, and I looked at it and I thought, oh, that must be one of the test images from the Arizona desert that they did when they were you know, uh, um, testing the camera before launch. Uh, I didn't really think that that's what we were going to see, these, uh, these kind of dendritic uh, channel structures. Uh, but there we are, uh, uh, dried up riverbeds on Titan. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to the next one. And when they got to the surface, uh, we saw this. There was actually just uh, one camera with a narrow field of view. As it came down. Oh, dear. Again. Uh oh. Is he frozen? We've got robot voice going on. Okay. Phil, I'm not sure if you can hear us. If you can, we can't hear you. In the meantime, um, so this image is taken from the surface of Titan, obviously. So this would have been uh, from the Huygens probe, which was launched with Cassini with the the, object, the objective of landing on the surface of Titan. Um, at that time, 2005, the surfaces we had been on would have been Venus, uh, Moon, Mars, and that's it. So it would have been pre, uh, well. All he's right. Oh, well, he's back. Back again. <laughs> So I was just oh, highlighting so maybe, that. Like everybody was done. Maybe it was only me. Um, okay, so there we are. Anyway, okay, let's move on and uh, look at some more. Oh no. Hey. Okay. Yeah. So of course the spacecraft monitors the atmosphere of Saturn, which is very active. There's a giant storm that appeared in the northern hemisphere, uh, and gradually got stretched out around the planet by the by the winds. But that kind of atmospheric monitoring went on for half a Saturn year. Uh, 13 Earth years, uh, so a substantial amount of time. And uh, one thing that affects the atmosphere of Saturn, unlike any other planet, uh, is the presence of the shadow of, of the rings. And you can get a sense from that picture that somewhere in the southern hemisphere there below the rings, uh, that the atmosphere would be cooler because it's shadowed. Uh, and that, those shadows, they can move much further south and then they can flip into the northern hemisphere and be much further north. Uh, constantly changing as the uh, seasons progress on Saturn, as seasons like we do. 
uh, uh, so uh, we got to monitor all of those changes for a long time, and it was uh, that was great. Let's move on there. So actually, Robbie's oh, Rob, Rob's got a point about the surface image. Um, yes, they are really rounded, uh, and uh, it's possible that that's because uh, you know all of those channels. Uh, that we see mean that there, there is fluid flowing on the surface. It's not water, though. There is water in that view, but it's the rocks, right? They're, uh, they're, they're ice. Uh, the, the, the land masses on Titan, if you like to call them that, are, are ice. Uh, and any liquid that's flowing is liquid methane. Uh, but it could flow and it could roll over the surface and it could round those, uh, those pebbles. All right, and uh, then of course there's the rings. The rings are amazingly dynamic as well. Uh, and I'm only showing a couple here, uh, special pictures uh, of the rings uh, that were taken when the, uh, when the sun was almost in the plane of the rings. So any little irregularity in the rings would cast a shadow. And we see that there are a lot of those things. Uh, the little image on the left uh, shows a small moon casting its shadow across the ring system. Uh, a, ring, uh, a small moon that actually is orbiting inside a little gap in the rings. Uh, so, very, very interesting uh, uh, world with these dynamic rings. And we might learn quite a lot about other disks from those rings, you know, including things like the, uh, uh, the very early solar system as the planets were forming in a great big uh, uh, cloud of dust and, and gas but, uh, with the dust forming uh, a ring system around the sun as the planets are gradually forming. So, you know, we might learn something from these rings about uh, other kinds of disks as well. Yeah, and okay. like, yeah, like these. Oh, I think I get an echo or also Phil, I think. Uh, the, the existence of these little moonlets in Saturn's ring system and just the dynamism of the ring system as a whole, like, system's the right word. There's formation of these little moons, there's evidence of them breaking apart. But, like, even looking right here, this moonlet forms and it starts clearing a path through. You also have instances where these moons are not on the same plane. So they're a little bit off just by a bit. So they pull the ring up and down towards it as it kind of passes through. So you get these kind of fluttering in Saturn's rings, which you can see, I think a little bit of here as well. And you had this, that was this also this propeller phenomenon where you get like these, <laughs> these waving rings and different shadows coming off of them. So Saturn's rings, which from like Voyager look uniform and simple, um, and I don't know to what extent astronomers were expecting dynamism or activity. Cassini really showed that if we come back in 30 years and look at the rings, they might not be completely different, but they'll be significantly different, uh, which is really cool to see. Like, not just is the atmosphere changing, Saturn has an entire rock system around it that's changing. I think Phil froze again, possibly. Oh, yeah, it's not letting me unmute him. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. I just had him hey, muted guys. to get rid of that. <laughs> okay. Here's yeah, a great so, picture. Yeah. Yeah, I took this myself in the process of using. Oh, very nice. Um, <laughs> so you could probably explain this way better than me, but this I call this picture a bit of a mind fuck because making sense of it from an initial viewing is difficult. I, well, I found it difficult. And you actually had this at an old space club at Western. And I think you asked us, like, what do you think is happening here? Um, so, Phil, could you explain? <laughs> All right. So the, uh, now uh, the sun ought to be in that picture, but it's behind Saturn. So we can't see the sun at all. Uh, the spacecraft is in eclipse, basically, in the shadow of Saturn. Uh, looking back at Saturn, uh, some of the sunlight filters through the rings, so uh, we can see that even though we're looking at the underside, the shaded underside of the rings, but some light filters through. And where the rings are darkest, kind of in the middle of the ring system, that's where the rings are thicker, so less light filters through. That's the B ring. Uh, uh, and then Saturn itself ought to be completely invisible uh, because we're looking at the shadow, except that some light from uh, the left and the right sides uh, of the rings uh, is reflected onto the planet. So we're, we're seeing uh, the planet illuminated by light reflected off the rings. Uh, and uh, down at the right at the bottom is a very faint arc, kind of slightly bluish in that image. 
which would be the e-ring a very faint outer ring yeah running across there so all yeah back to it. the e-ring will come back back in a in tanya's pick but mm -hmm. yeah so the image is cassini is looking at saturn and the sun's on the other side so typically you shouldn't be able to see anything but because the rings act as like a mirror uh you get this really strange what i call the baseball cap image of saturn where it's like it looks like it's wearing a bath cords hat and yeah you're getting a, a perspective of the the far side of saturn from the perspective of earth and the sun yeah great that's very cool okay and then there's the fabulous titan uh, the only moon with a thick atmosphere in our solar system uh, so superficially Earth-like in some ways, but really very unearth-like. These are just uh, pictures that show what it looks like if, if to your eye at the top, uh, and then with infrared vision at the bottom, a couple of different views. So there are certainly things to look at on that surface. Uh, let's go a little bit closer here, the next picture. And uh, um, uh, so visual and infrared imaging shows us some things, but uh, Cassini also had a radar uh, and that can penetrate right through the clouds and haze and see what's on the surface. At the top, we're seeing uh, dark linear sand dunes uh, near the equator. And at the bottom, uh, lakes, the dark stuff is, is liquid uh, and uh, dried up river channels. And maybe some of them aren't dry, I'm not sure, uh, uh, flowing into those lakes. Uh, uh, and that's uh, near the North Pole. So a very varied uh, surface. Uh, okay, uh, but there are lots of moons and they're amazingly diverse. Uh, so here we've got three of them, uh, a couple of them with lots of craters, one of them with a very, very rugged surface, and another one that is so smooth that you can't even see any craters on it. There's some very faint little dark markings, but you know, you can see they're extraordinarily varied. And of course, very varied in size. That little one, Methone, is only three kilometers across, and the big one, Hyperion, uh, well, uh, uh, the other two, 300 and 400 kilometers across. So a huge variation. But the moons are not at all what you would necessarily expect to begin with, uh, especially that very, very smooth little thing, very peculiar object. Uh, yeah. And okay. Well, Mimas, so that, I assume, is a complex crater with like a central uplift. Yeah, that's right. That big of an object, why didn't it just destroy Mimas? Um, people often say that, but it takes a lot more energy to destroy uh, a world than you might think. Uh, I mean, basically, something, something hit Amos there. It's something hit Amos, sentence. and a shockwave spreads out and digs that crater. But as the shockwave spreads out, it gets weaker and weaker. And when it can't dig a crater anymore, you stop. Well, if you want to destroy Amos, you've got to have such a big impact that that shockwave spreads through the whole body. So it's going to be a lot bigger than the thing that made that crater. So, okay. okay, I buy it. I buy it. Okay, let's move on. Here's a couple of nice round ones. Uh, they might be round, but they're still doing interesting things. Uh, Dione has all these cracks on the surface, um, and uh, uh, Iapetus at the, the bottom has very dark patches and, and light patches. It has a very peculiar ridge running right around the equator for about three quarters of its circumference. Um, uh, which is just faintly visible at the right-hand edge of that picture. A very peculiar world anyway. So so some of them look like that. But now let's have a look at the, the next set. Others are really bizarre shapes. Look at these strange objects. Um, uh, Pan at the top kind of has a, uh, a, a belt of material all around it. Uh, that's around its equator. And that's the moon that is embedded in the rings. And so material is probably precipitated out from the rings to build up that strange uh, belt around its equator. Um, but uh, a very peculiar looking object. And some are extremely elongated, like Prometheus at bottom left there, 135 kilometers long, but it's only about 40 kilometers across around the middle. So very elongated, like a, a shard maybe of a br larger object that's been broken. Uh, is there and, any um, estimate on how steep the sides are of that equatorial ravioli bit on pan? Well, it ha uh, we do have stereo images of that, so that information would be available, but I, I don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting object. 
And here's Tanya's pick, a great picture of the E-ring, which surrounds the main rings. It's further out than the main rings that you see, and it's really very faint, so you really have to uh, take a long exposure picture or crank up the contrast to see something. But right in the middle, there's a funny little thing, uh, which is actually the moon Enceladus, uh, which we're going to look at in a moment, um, uh, which uh, is a nice little moon 500 kilometers across that is blasting out jets of water vapor from its south pole and that the water vapor kind of crystallizes and the ice crystals form this giant ring so a tiny little moon blowing stuff out from cracks in its south pole uh builds up a ring around an entire giant planet quite an amazing thing it's worth noting here the bright spot that you see in that ring there that's not Enceladus. Enceladus is the dark spot, and the yeah. bright spot is all the stuff coming out of the geysers that are making this ring, which blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, a, it. okay, yeah, it's a lot smaller, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's small. This Phil, is why you... I really want to see a mission to Enceladus, because yeah. literally um, yeah. spewing out of an ocean into space. You know, yeah. you're always cool too, I guess, but I think Enceladus. <laughs> Cooler. <laughs> yeah, we, we may we may get to see that. Okay, let's move on to the next picture. Here's Enceladus closer up. The surface has a few craters on it that you can see here and there, especially on the right hand side there. Uh, but most of it is very much broken up. It's been fractured. Pieces have moved around. Uh, it's uh, a very um, strange looking object. It's clearly been very active. And at the bottom, we can see some of those jets of water vapor escaping from cracks at the south pole of the moon. Uh, so really quite a dramatic object. And uh, this is a close-up showing those cracks that are producing those uh, jets. When you look down on them like this, the jets are, are faint against the illuminated surface of the moon. So uh, we can't see the jets there, but uh, they would actually be blowing right up out of the surface uh, when that picture is taken. It's just that we can't see them in that view. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the view at the top left there shows the jets coming out of the, uh, the South Pole. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there is there is a thought that a future mission might be able to fly through those jets and collect samples of them for analysis. It's kind of interesting, like from bird's eye view of the features giving off the jets, they're not really that remarkable. Like there's nothing, there's no obvious geyser sitting there that looks really, really cool. I guess it also has to do with resolution, but, but I would have expected to see something more dynamic and interesting, but it just kind of looks like the rest of the planet. Well, uh, it's because they're 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 faint. Uh, so in an image like that one at the at the top, um, I, I think the uh, um, we're seeing them because they're silhouetted against the blackness of space, uh, uh, and they've probably been brightened anyway to make them more visible. Uh, but uh, when you're looking down on them against that very bright background of the surface of the moon, uh, they just don't show up. And uh, there's that spacecraft. Uh, there's a little person down at the, uh, at the bottom of it that shows how big the spacecraft is. It's kind of the size of a bus, uh, a big thing. And it's still amazing to me that we can build something like that. And people you know, spend a decade or more building a spacecraft like that and more time planning it. Uh, and they build it and they trust it to a giant rocket, put it on top of the rocket, fire it off into space. And it can do these amazing things. Uh, it's uh, it's really you know, just about the, the best that humans are capable of in, in many ways, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, so that that's our rundown of Cassini, end of the news for the week. Um, I don't know, you, Phil, you mentioned Chang'e 4 and 5 would be awesome for next month. Um, yes, yeah, so next, uh, well. that's right. So next month we'll see... We'll see China 5 uh, yeah. try to collect a sample from the, surface of the moon and bring it back to Earth. Uh, so, uh, yes, next time maybe we can talk about China 4 and China 5. That should be interesting. Uh, they're Sweet. due to launch China 5 on the 24th of November, 24th of this month. So, yeah, we're right. coming up to it. Okay, well, that would be a good time. Yeah, if there are any other deep dive topics that anybody tuned in would be interested in seeing, definitely pop it in the comments and we can keep it on a list for future episodes. Okay. Absolutely. Go All ahead. right. Well, I think we can uh, wrap it up there. Thanks for everyone who joined. Uh, what On those, Tanya, on, on our screen, those little like pin drops, what site is that? 
the that pin drop. Uh, oh, that's Twitter. Okay, cool. So yeah, everyone who joined on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, uh, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for participating in the chat and asking questions. Um, and we'll be back in roughly a month's time to talk about uh, the, the Chang emissions. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that comment is, but yeah. Um, yeah, this is our new poster for the show as a whole. Uh, we'll be back on a, on a, like I said, monthly basis. Phil will be back, which is why people tune in, of course. <laughs> um, and I'll be back with more facts. I'll be Googling. Yeah, I'll be back from abstracts. I'm here for terrible sort of comedic relief that probably doesn't actually <laughs> land well, but you know, I keep trying. You're a real scientist though. You can, you know, you can try. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's, Phil's quick to point that out. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, let's let everyone go. And uh, thanks. Thanks to everyone. We'll see you in a month. Thank you, Bye. Ian. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everyone. <laughs>